Last week, we introduced a topic where we spent some time learning about the word rest, the word peace, and the word joy, and its true biblical application for our understanding. As we looked at these words, we came to understand quite clearly that we needed to change the way we think the way we comprehend their use, not only in Scripture, but in the application to our lives and seeking them. And we talked about the change of mindset truly needed to comprehend these things in our life. And as I mentioned last week, as the Lord wills, we would come to tonight and we would talk about the work necessary then with the new attitude to truly achieve these things in our lives. Now, as the the screen simply puts, I'm not by any means, shape, or form uh, a fan of reggae music, but there was a song that came out a long time ago, and about the only thing I could probably ever tell you about reggae music is this song came out and it said, everybody want to go to heaven, nobody want to do the work. Well, it's the only verse I think I'll ever remember, probably only ever come to my mind if you were to ask me anything about it. But with that said, it's very similar in nature to what we're talking about here. We have the concept of we desire to have what Jesus promised. Uh, In Matthew, we talked about just last week, just as a reminder, Matthew chapter 11, we talked about, and as was our scripture reading this morning, the concept of his promise that all those who come to him would receive rest. Now, this rest was not a nap on a pallet. This rest was literally... Uh, the concept where we have the harmonious working of all of our faculties and affections on a true purpose. Jesus says, come to me. Stop looking for the rest. I am the purpose and can give you the meaning of life, can give you a direction to go that will satisfy all your longing. And that's the true use of the term. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, we took a look at Jesus promising his disciples before his departure that he would give them peace. Um, And then in chapter 15, that he would give them joy. The peace that he promised them was not as the world gives. In other words, this was not the concept where we hope that no one attacks us. The peace here was in relationship. The peace here is particularly poignant in the promise to his disciples in their relationship in peace and mind with God. And he promised that he would give them this peace, even in the midst of the difficulties of the work that God was going to give them, that he would still give them peace. The joy he talked about was not uh, the delight joy or the, the entertainment joy or fun that we often think of in our lives today, and has made its way into, the, into uh, service to God, but it is the joy that comes from knowing that our relationship with God has been healed. It is a joy to know that we are right with our Maker, and we are then living to the purposes He has created us. Now keep in mind, Jesus told them that He would give them peace and He would give them joy, but He said that the world hated Him and it was going to hate them too. So you know that this concept of rest and joy and peace is not necessarily the way the world disseminates that information at all. But it was a mindset to know that in our relationship with God, we were going to be in such a way with him as to have a protected environment with him in that relationship. Brother John mentioned this morning that Satan can have no power over me if I don't give it to him. Powerful statement and a a very appropriate understanding. It's a very understanding that uh, Romans chapter 8 talks about, that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God or the love of Jesus Christ. No outside force can, but if you'll notice when you read that, there is one thing missing. Me. Me. Because I do have the power to separate, thus causing chaos. 
What I'm trying to say is we can have a peace that no one else can steal from us. We can have an understanding of, of fulfillment and an understanding of joy in our lives that no one can take from us, provided we understand it correctly and we do the work to maintain it. Okay? So the work becomes very important. And the work is what I want to focus on tonight. So we're going to do some spiritual algebra. So all of you went through algebra through school and you said, I'm never going to use this. I'm about to prove you wrong. We are going to use it. Uh, we're going to use it in a spiritual sense, of course. But we have to appreciate that as God reveals us this formula, the factors have to be in the order he revealed them in order to achieve rest, peace, and joy. You can't change the factors around and hope to attain it. You don't have the right to take away the value of any of the factors. We have to appreciate the formula as given to us by God himself. Now, if you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to use this as our foundation. This is a repetitive pattern, but uh, this passage in uh, Peter as he's writing to Christians is probably one of the easiest to follow in order to see the pattern unfold. Now, while you're turning to 2 Peter, uh, I'll have you understand Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, as he mentions in verse 1, same Peter who wrote the first letter and writing it to the same exact group of Christians that he wrote the first letter to. These Christians know Peter. What I mean by that is these are Christians from Judea, where Peter stayed and did the bulk of his work. They knew him. They knew him by person. They knew his teaching. They knew what he stood for as an apostle of Jesus Christ. In the first letter, in the first chapter, we see these Christians are no longer living in Judea. They've been forced to leave and go to Asia Minor. And they're scattered in various parts of Asia Minor. And as such... The first letter is written to them to give them hope. It's unsettling to move, to uproot and move to a new place, especially if, you're, if you have a Jewish background and now you find yourself living amongst Gentiles. This was unsettling, so he's focusing and helping them to focus on their hope. The second letter to the same group, now wanting to leave them something, knowing that he's about to die, no longer being able to work with them, write to them, uphold them as an apostle physically, he wants to leave them with something that can sustain them continually. So the second letter, the focus is knowledge. What a wonderful thought process. And we're going to learn in the, in the opening, it's not just any kind of knowledge, it's not just algebra, it's the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's an important understanding and focus. So with that, if look at first four verses, then we'll, um, we'll define our why, the first part of our formula. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteous, righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, Jesus our Lord. As his power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, in the process of this foundation of knowledge being predicated in Jesus Christ, did you notice the last part of verse 4. He says, after having us understand that we are partakers of a divine nature, he shares that having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Brethren, when we do not understand our true purpose, as Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you rest, you no longer have to fight for this. Notice that there are so many bad destinations that can be found by us when we are trying to ascertain a purpose, trying to come up with why I'm, I should be here, what am I supposed to be doing? When left to me and my own faculties, 
the destinations in this world that I can find and the lust of it are endless and they're toxic. They're toxic by nature, causing me to live for me, to elevate my needs, my purposes over everyone else's, and not allow me even minutely to fulfill the purposes I was created to attain. It is important that we understand, brethren, more than anything else, that God created us for a very specific purpose. And you should know your why. You should know why it is you serve the Lord. You should know why it is it should be most important to you in your life. You should know why you stand on that foundation. And you should be able to recall it quickly when you need it against temptation that we talked about this morning, against this world and its toxic toxicity, if I get my mouth to cooperate with my brain, all of these things are, it's so important. Listen, I'll give you an understanding as we, as we read here, and it talks about these Christians knowing, and Peter recognizing with them that they have obtained a like precious faith. There was something in their lives so important that they were willing to stop living any other way and live to this. That's a why that's important. Now, when I talk about being able to call your why into use when you need it the most, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You remember Joshua, who took over after Moses to lead the children of Israel? He led them into the promised land. He led them through the conquest of the promised land, uh, and all the problems that came with being the leader of the children of Israel in the flesh. And at the end of his life, in the 24th chapter of Joshua, he stood before the congregation of Israel, stood before them and said, you choose this day whom you will serve. You want to know what his why was? As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. That was his why. He was able to recall it when he needed it. He was able to stand in it. He was able to point his finger at the congregation of Israel, knowing that they had no intent to keep it, and say, you do what you want, I'm going to do it. That's a why. That's a why. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1. There's another one that comes to mind when we talk about having a why and being able to recall it. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Boy, that's a why. That's a why, isn't it? That's someone who understood exactly what he was made to do. Exactly what he was called to do. And exactly what was expected of him to live to. Do we see that in the life of Paul? You bet. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. There's a good why. Paul was able in virtually every letter he wrote to call to mind with the brethren that he wrote the letter to how he lived among them. How was he able to achieve such a thing? He understood what a powerful why was in his life. Remember, he was able to say often that he tried to live in good conscience between men and God always. What do we know about that? There was a time in Paul's life his conscience wasn't educated. But he was always striving to know the will of God. And when the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and gave him an understanding of the true purpose that he was called to to serve God, this was a man who gave up everything. He was on the fast track, if you will. Uh, his own words in Galatians chapter 1, he was uh, farther advanced in Judaism uh, than all his contemporaries. This was somebody that would have served on the council, would have had it made, uh, would have been probably one of the master rabbis of his day. All of these things were his future if he had stayed on the old path. But his why was corrected. And because it was so powerful in his life, he changed. Not a little bit. Didn't play at it. Two sides of a fence. He committed to it. And was able to recall it when he needed it the most. Brethren, 
This is more than just a slogan in your life. Your powerful why is the integrity that you need to have in service to the Lord. Integrity. Do what you say. Mean what you say. Accomplish who you say you are. Know what's expected of you from your Creator. This is how the why works in your life. Without a proper why, moving forward, it's not success written. Without the proper foundation and motivation for your life as a child of God in Christ Jesus, everything else we've talked about, or going to talk about, is going to be fruitless if this isn't right. That's why you can't change the factors of the formula. This has to be right first. We talk about a lot, John preaches tremendously well concerning the nature and the condition necessary in our hearts in order to serve the Lord faithfully. Without that set correctly, everything else is going to be fruitless. Verse 5. But also for this very reason, based on the fact that they understood their why, based on the fact that they were ready to move forward, motivated correctly, but also for this reason, giving all diligence. Now, giving all diligence is not a word to skip over quickly. This word diligence means that you're going to put forth great effort here. This is purposeful action, folks. These are the things that now we know who we belong to, what we're expected to attain in our relationship. This is the great effort necessary to then make the transformations, as Paul did. But as for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control to self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being either barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. This is the purposeful actions that we are to attain. There are so many people that are born into Christ Jesus that, that come out of the water grave of baptism and they think, well, I'll just attend services and I'll just, I'll keep coming and these things will all just magically happen to me. Folks, the expectation is that starting with the fact that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we are to take that foundation and then build character that produces benefits. And the benefits are not just for me. They make me beneficial to God. They make me beneficial to all those around me. There's some things in here that are kind of important. Self-control. A lot of us struggle. I raise my own hand. A lot of us struggle in life with uh, things that cause us to forget who we belong to, what our why is, who, what we should be doing as uh, children of God in representation so that the world should be able to see God living in me. There's many of us who forget. There's many of us who get caught up in the worldly things uh, that happen quite often. And we allow those things to change our character. Folks, the Spirit through Peter says no. Spirit through Peter says much more diligence should be given the other way. To create within you this concept of moving away from the world. And it, listen, folks, that doesn't mean you don't work. That doesn't mean you don't provide for your families. That doesn't mean that these kind of things aren't important. We already know that the Spirit through Paul uh, was quite clear that if a man does not 
uh, provide for his own, he's worse than an unbeliever. Did you hear that? Worse than an unbeliever. There are, we know what's going to happen to those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the promise God has made for them. To be worse than that is, is unfathomable to me. How anyone could not understand that role of provision, provision for the needs of my family, the provision for the, for the needs of them uh, emotionally, stability, the home, all of these things are part of what we're supposed to provide. If I don't learn self-control, if I don't learn through the Word of God to produce in me this understanding of other things being more important than me, achievement of these purposeful actions, fruitless. But it has to start, once again, with the proper foundation, what's truly most important. Secondly, to build on it and the expectation that we build and grow, just as it would be for an apprentice that is expected to be grown into someone who uh, is able to be then uh, well-trained and fully functional in their particular roles. We expect this in life. Why, why is it different mindset in Christ that we can be stuck in a place forever and not have to produce? It's silly. Scripture talks about it in terms of maturity. Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, we often talk about Hebrews chapter 5, the fact that uh, these Christians uh, had not grown and needed to be fed again as babes. But it talks about meat is for mature Christians. There is an expectation that we mature. That we stop being apprentices. That we hit a level where these behaviors, these purposeful actions become easier for us to attain because God's word gives us the strength to do it. And we're trusting work of faith, the trusting it more, thus producing in our lives more. Listen, if the course of your life is wrong, if it is overwhelming and your life is filled with anxiety because of work, because of money, because of bills, because of this or because of that, and these things are overwhelming you instead of working on your faith too, such things as virtue, such things as, and virtue, by the way, is a wonderful way and a, a really nice way of saying uh, being full of integrity. But virtue, uh, to the knowledge of Scripture, to be able to use it when you need it, and self-control, uh, perseverance, and godliness, all these things, it's because your foundation is wrong. The foundation is wrong. And just as it was this morning when we were talking about Revelation chapter 3, you have to go back and do the first works. The very first work you've got to rebuild is why. Why your life is truly uh, aimed in the wrong direction and what you've got to do to aim it right. You've got to rebuild. And then you have to set purposeful action in front of you to achieve as God directs you. As God directs you. Lastly, look at the last two verses. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I, I know you all know that I'm not afraid to write in my Bible. But right off the side of here, next to those two verses, I wrote, rest, peace, and joy. That's the comprehension of what we're trying to achieve. But notice this emotional stability. Notice this relationship stability with God was not at the beginning. Once again, I remind you, you can't change the factors around and hope to achieve this. You have to do them in the right order. You must establish your why in your life, what's truly most important. You must then engage in purposeful action, which changes your character. It changes who you are, both to the Lord and to those who you become a benefit to. And it brings you to this state where your trust in the Lord's promises, your understanding of the benefits inherent to serving others becomes real to you. 
It gives you a sense of peace to see the blessing you become for someone else. It it gives you a sense of peace to know that you have been productive in something more, something greater than yourself. Emotional stability. So many of, some of you know, many of you know, I worked many years with alcoholics and addicts. And it's not enough that you give them 30 days and you get poison out of their system. Folks, at the root of all of these horrible uh, isms is a life with no purpose, is a life with no direction, is a life with no understanding of where and what should be being attained by these individuals. We did not just take drugs out of their systems. We taught them how to live. I was privileged to introduce to them how God expects them to live, to give them a true why, purposeful action, and then at the end of that, emotional stability. I bring this up to tell you this. If you've ever worked with addicts and alcoholics, they always want the emotional stability first. And it's because they can't find the emotional stability, they use that as the excuse to use, to drink. Because the chaos brings them so much pain, only drugging themselves or drinking themselves out of their gourd gives them peace. Brother, I'm telling you, peace is achieved only with great effort. Rest, peace, and joy is attainable in our relationship and our life with God and can be who we are, provided we're willing to do the work in the right order. Now, you can ask all day long and twice on Sunday, David, isn't there an easier way? No. No. And I'll tell you the same thing my grandmother told me when I was a boy, that God tells us anything worthwhile is worth working for. Be diligent. Be diligent to present yourself a worker who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why does, why does the Spirit tell us that? Because it's great effort to learn the word of God and make it useful to me in my life, purposeful to me for action to bring me to a state of being right with God and giving me that relationship bubble, if you will, to know that God is with me, I am right with Him, and all things in this life are not important other than that. If we come to those understanding, these things can be ours. And all the chaos of the world can't touch me then. Sadness, we're all going to know it. Pain, we're all going to know it, but we have hope. We can know that too, and we can persevere to the other side. If you're here, and as a child of God in Christ Jesus, your life is not set right. You don't know you have tomorrow. Fix it now. Fix it now. Fix your why today. Not tomorrow. Not the next day, not, oh, try to get around to it. Folks, you don't know that that's going to be given to you. Fix it now. Set your why correctly tonight. Begin your purposeful actions immediately so you can begin to see a change in your life for the better. Know then the encouragement that will come from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 calls him the God of all comfort. You want to know why? Because when we have done this work correctly, he gives us the comfort of knowing that we are right with him. It's a peace that can't be described virtually in words, but you will feel it when it's set correctly. If you're here tonight and you have not obeyed the gospel, but this world has overwhelmed you and you're tired of that, and you want a purpose in a right direction, the gospel of Jesus Christ was given to give that. I am the way, the truth, and light. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. Why? It's in him this begins. You must believe that he is the Son of God. You must believe that he was sent as a sacrifice for our sins 
so that we could be cleansed and presented whole to God. You must understand then that He expects us to change our lives and live to His purposes, both as a foundation in our actions and then the stability of our character in emotion. We must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you must rise from that water grave of baptism seeking the new life with all your heart and all your soul. If you're here tonight and you're subject to that invitation and there's anyone here that we can help get that road set, get the path set correctly, we are here to serve you. Won't you come as we stand and sing?